So uh, we have a lot of questions. I wanted to start with one which I'm guessing both of you have already thought a lot about, which is that clearly we're living in very challenging times. And one thing that's come up is how do you think we can improve upon and deepen society's view of science and its impact in our lives? Maybe, Francis, we can start with you and then Bill. Well, the best way to do it is have science serve people, right? People have the impression that, that science harms them or it's dangerous uh, and, or they don't see the beauty in it. But if it serves people and it solves problems, then I think that's a great step forward. And Bill? Yes. yes, well, I certainly agree with that. I think another way in which we can do it, which, which Francis already alluded to, is to do exactly what Francis does. In other words, engage the public, give presentations like the one that she gave that are accessible to the public so that they can develop an appreciation for the fact that science is doing these things for them. Because, you know, I mean, look, look at where we are right now. Science has done an amazing thing. It's created a vaccine that uh, works against uh, uh, COVID-19 in ways that are apparently better than most vaccines do. And yet people are, um, are afraid of them, or at least some people are. And why is that? I, I don't really understand it, but it seems to me that, that engaging people in ways that they can understand, so that they understand that it's not going to change your RNA, which a lot of people say is, is one of the reasons why they, they, they don't want to get it. We need to engage the public in a way that is, um, is accessible to them. Well, well science has not always uh, been spreading its benefits evenly, right? So some communities don't trust vaccines because in the past, sure. it, the science has been used in a not so beneficial way. And, um, and you can understand the skepticism uh, that, that some people would have. Sure. I mean, all you have to do is think about something like the Tuskegee uh, uh, study, and you can see why, uh, for example, the African-American community would be um, uh, hesitant about the kind of thing that, uh, that uh, is, is being promoted by the government, because this was something that was... Uh, exactly. And, and so how do, you, how do you address that? Well, one way uh, uh, is in, in the church that I go to, there are two sisters who are both physicians who are black, and they have a blog in which they talk about these kinds of things. Uh, so this is really effective, but of course it's not as global as what we need. Yeah, and you know, not only is this important throughout science, but particularly when listening to both of your presentations from directed evolution to quantum technologies, these are both areas where it's really important to get scientific and public appreciation working together, right, to drive this. So, you know, I, I wanted to follow on, uh, so thank you very much. I wanted to follow on something that Frances raised a bit at the end in her um, answer, which is, you know, at the end of the day, how can we encourage more of our students to follow careers in science and engineering? And to this point, sort of following what Frances said, you know, how can we develop a more inclusive model for engagement? Because in new disciplines, say, let's start with you, Bill, in areas like quantum information and quantum technology, we have a moment in time where we can change the model right, for workforce development with a paradigm shift in technology. Have you had any thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I've had thoughts. The trouble is, you know, whether they're good ones. Um, right now, uh, the University of Maryland uh, is partnering with Morgan State University, which is a historically black uh, uh, college university, uh, trying to make better um, contact with the African-American student community to try to draw them into quantum science. Um, you know, the motivation for this is very clear to us. If we leave out sectors of our society, be they minorities, be they women, uh, and of course in physics, we got a big problem with women, not so much in Francis's field, uh, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. And, and the question is how? 
how to do it. Um, uh, so many people have tried so many different approaches to try to get minority communities, women more interested in physics with only limited success. I mean, I've been working on this for the past 40 years and the success, it's not been negligible, but it has been limited. And I just wish I knew what the answer was. We're trying some new things, um, some Oxford style tutorial uh, things we're gonna try to set up. Um, you use the scientific method. You try something, see if it works. <laughs> and Francis? Well, if you look what talented women and talented minorities are doing, often it goes to uh, fields that they feel are serving their communities or that are uh, serving the planet. Um, Health care, for example, is very attractive to women. If we did a better job at explaining how chemistry <laughs> can help the planet or how physics can help the planet, I think we'd see a lot more of those talented uh, people coming into the field, especially the women. Yeah, well, Francis, I couldn't help but notice your multiple references to Star Trek. And so maybe <laughs> there's a way that uh, all of us can conspire to generate some new television series to reach a broader public. You know, in the PME, that's one of the reasons we started a theme in arts, science, and technology, to come up with new ways to engage with the public and introduce them to a lot of the new directions in science and technology. So, you know, when we think about new directions, it does bring me to the next questions we've gotten, which is, what do you think are the biggest challenges in your respective fields? Francis, maybe we could start with you. And Bill, you can think a little bit. <laughs> well, I make things, so... Uh, not just pushing electrons around, but, you know, and, and I, I, I watch with, with envy how you can set up a company in the information sciences and get products out right away. And a little bit was, there was some talk about that this morning in the innovation space. In synthetic biology, it's expensive and slow to, to set up companies and it takes work. But in the end, we can't eat electrons. We actually have to make stuff and we have to make stuff, food, clothing, materials. We have to do it a lot better than we have in the past. And so the challenge is to speed it up and bring the costs down. It's an engineering challenge and innovation in the science is a good way to make that happen. And Bill? Well, there are so many ways that I can imagine answering your question. If your question is, what's the big challenge in physics? One of them is a theory that somehow unifies gravity with uh, quantum mechanics. This is one of the great dreams. If it's in the area of, um, you know, more close to what I, what I do, what I was talking about, quantum physics, that I would say that it's, um, it's, it's doing either quantum computations or quantum simulations that people actually care about that you cannot do with a classical computer. There are simple models for the way that solids behave that we cannot calculate to know what the consequences of these models are. And one of the, the reasons why this is such a uh, an important problem is that some of these models may explain high temperature superconductivity, which is something we don't understand. I mean, think about this, how long it's been that we've had superconductors that work at temperatures higher than liquid nitrogen temperatures, and we don't know how they work. And one of the reasons is that some of the models cannot be calculated. We don't know what the, uh, uh, what the consequences of certain simple models are. If we did, then maybe we could figure out how to make those those materials even better because understanding is the beginning of progress in so many things. Um, and I can see <laughs> Frances smiling <laughs> uh, that, that that's true in her field as well. So, well, so actually I was <laughs> smiling because evolution doesn't understand anything yet. It works extremely well. No, that's true. And that's a very, <laughs> that's, 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 a, that's a really important insight. One of the questions I was going to ask you was how far are we, from doing something that's more intelligent than just picking out the things that uh, uh, 
that, that happen to work when you take a scattergun approach to it. In other words, intelligent evolution rather than blind evolution. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what we hope to do in engineering materials that could change people's lives, that could make energy more efficient, that make, make uh, uh, solar energy conversion more efficient, for example. These are the kinds of things I dream about quantum uh, information systems doing. Well, you know, I'm trained as an engineer. You make it and then you figure it out. <laughs> and, and, and actually, it takes much longer to figure things out than it does to make them when you've got a powerful process like machine learning. You know, directed evolution now is a machine learning problem. We're, and we're generating lots and lots of data from which we can learn. Do we get the physical insight, right? Can we describe it in a simple model? No. But maybe that's the answer, is that it's not describable in a simple model. Well, and you've brought up uh, something that I think is a really important theme in modern science uh, about um, the, the different ways of, of doing things, a reductionist approach or an emergent approach. And um, probably both things are necessary, but as a physicist, you know, I'm really a reductionist. <laughs> <laughs> I deal with people like you all the time. And they're very disappointed in my talks because I haven't explained how those mutations are doing what they do. <laughs> oh, but I love it. I love what you're doing because it's so, it's so productive. And I really think we need both kinds of approaches. We're not gonna, we're not gonna solve the problems that, that, that we need to solve if we, limit ourselves to one way or another way of thinking about nature. So while I'd love to continue this train of discussion <laughs> and actually interject my own thoughts, I won't. Uh, I'd, I'd like to instead use some of our time to answer some questions that keep coming in from uh, our virtual audience. So one of them actually goes back to the world of public engagement, which is that when you think about uh, public engagement, such as television series in general, uh, they tend to engage the public far more than journals, right? which is certainly true. But they also often tend to be less accurate. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. so the question for both of you is, how do you strike that balance? How do you somehow come up with a way to make these methods more accurate? Uh, Bill, do you want to start with that? Well, I guess the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, uh, using television, which is a really a powerful medium or the television derivatives like uh, uh, streaming uh, uh, video on, uh, on computer platforms to use them in order to transmit uh, information that is reliable and correct. So I, I've seen plenty of things like this. You, you look at public television, you see somebody like Brian Greene, a physicist talking about really difficult quantum mechanical problems, but doing it in a way that's engaging and correct. The trouble is you don't get the audience for public television that you do for the Big Bang Theory. And why is that? Uh, I mean, I think Brian Greene's really attractive <laughs> as, a, as a personality on, on, these, on these shows. Uh, so, so I wish I knew. What we need is somebody who is a genius at programming. Look, even the people who do television don't know what works. Look at all the television programs that fail because nobody is engaged by them. So maybe this isn't something that, that is solved by using smart people. Maybe it's just something you have to keep working at. I just don't know. Yeah, or well, maybe have to be accurate, right? To be, to be um, inspirational. Look at Jurassic Park. How many <laughs> microbiologists and biologists took up that profession because they were inspired or by Star Trek or any number of things that are not necessarily accurate, but are inspirational. What we do have to fight against, of course, is misinformation that's dangerous. And so we have to, uh, I, I mean, I, I don't get worked up when people are inaccurate with my work about silicon, for example, because it just engaged so many people. And if they're interested, they'll go and read why silicon-based life is probably not <laughs> chemically possible. Uh, but at least they clicked on it and they started looking at it. What, what actually is happening here? 
So Francis, I, I was just handed a question for you in particular, which is, and it touches on what Bill said, do you see a role for quantum sensing and quantum imaging to enhance the screening and selection process for directed evolution? Probably not in my scientific <laughs> lifetime, which is not <laughs> that much longer, but the, uh, I mean, I don't know. I haven't thought about that one. You know, our screening is, is not really high throughput. It's not, um, you know, mega science there. So I, I don't see that. But for the machine learning, could well be. So if I could put in my two cents, uh, when we think about quantum sensing, one of the things we think about is the possibility of, of imaging, for example, really fragile systems. And, and at least the story we like to tell is that sometimes biological systems are really fragile. So shining a whole lot of light on them or uh, x-rays or whatever might not be the thing to do if you want them to maintain function. Um, and so quantum sensing may give you the possibility of learning what you want to learn without burning them up. So there's a place that there might be a niche for, for, for where quantum sensing will come in, not because it'll do it faster, but because it might be able to do it without killing the, uh, the thing you're looking at. No, thanks, Bill. Now, I don't want either one of you to take this next question the wrong way, and I'm not sure exactly where it came from, but, um, well, Bill, why don't we start with you? If you had to pick another field to get into deeply, what would you choose? Well, was that supposed to be for me? <laughs> yeah, don't try and avoid it. That was actually for you, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I guess I, I missed the part that I was supposed to. To, uh, well, well, look, there, again, there's so many ways in which you could answer a question like that. One of the, the, the ways I could answer, but it's a little bit flip, is if I knew something that was more exciting than what I'm doing now, I'd be doing it. <laughs> but of course, that, um, uh, what, what that leaves out is just the kind of thing that, that Francis was talking about, is making things do things that are really far away from what they're doing already. And... Uh, that's the, um, uh, I, I think the thing that I might think about if I was really starting from scratch. If I was starting from scratch, I think I'd like to be in Francis's field because there's so many incredible things that are going on there that we don't understand uh, uh, much about. In my field, we understand a great deal of the basic stuff. And as a result, we can do all kinds of stuff that builds on that understanding. In Francis's field, things are moving really rapidly because of the fact that there are so many things that aren't understood and, and you, you learn so much faster when you're early in the learning curve. So it just seems, at least to an outsider, it seems really exciting. <laughs> and Francis? Well, I have to say that being a scientist is such a great career because you can reinvent yourself whenever you want. Um, I'm now spending most of my time learning about things I never paid attention to, politics in Washington yeah. and <laughs> pandemic preparedness, climate change. Um, and, and I find it absolutely fascinating to, to learn about what are the problems in all of these areas. I've also gotten uh, pretty deeply into AI and machine learning in the last few years. And, you know, you're never too old to learn something new and do something new. I probably won't do great work in the area, but at least I'll enjoy it. <laughs> well, uh, that leads into another question we received, which is what advice would you give to our students who are preparing <laughs> to launch their careers? Either one of you should feel free to start with that one. <laughs> Well, there's, there's a couple of things that I usually tell young people. One is stay curious. The thing that um, it seems to me sets scientists apart from everyone else who's gone through the educational uh, system is that scientists are those people for whom the educational system has failed to squeeze out their curiosity. <laughs> and so staying curious is one of the key things. The other thing is, uh, to do things that fascinate you. Uh, 
for one reason, for, for one reason for doing that is you're, you're probably gonna do a better job of, of teasing out the answers to problems if it's a problem that fascinates you. Uh, I try not to give too much advice. Everybody's path is different and, and there's no one way to, to enjoy or be successful in science other than to be flexible, <laughs> adaptable, evolvable. <laughs> and, and maybe as one final question for both of you, and uh, this is admittedly a little selfish, what advice would both of you give us here at the Pritzker School <laughs> As we think about our next 10 years and you look at what we've done and where we'd like to go, any thoughts or advice on your end for us, uh, Francis? Well, if I had come in person, I might, <laughs> might have been able to share, share something. But I think you're doing a marvelous job. I love the topics that you've chosen. I love molecular engineering. I think that's just such an exciting future. And if you keep hiring the best people, you'll get the best work. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I'll just amplify what Francis just said. For, for several decades, I had the best laboratory director one could ever want. Her name was Catherine Gebby. And people would ask her, what is the secret of your success as a director of a laboratory? And she said, hire the best people, give them the resources they need, and get out of their way. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that sounds like great advice. And I have to say, uh, Bill, that's largely what's been done here. Uh, uh, people have been wonderful in terms of resources and, um, and encouraging us. So listen, thank you both very, very much for spending your time with us. While we wish you were here in person, as Francis said, uh, this has been a wonderful option. We hope both of you will come here in person, you know, as we meet better times in the coming year. Again, thank you so much for speaking with us today.